Okay, let's let's settle down. Our routing is here. Uh, last but certainly not least, Patrick's going to tell us about Ceph, Zen, and CloudStack. All right, thanks. Maybe that should be last but certainly potentially least. Uh, I have the unenviable task of being the last guy between you guys and beer, so uh, we'll see if we can't get there a little faster and stay ahead of this wonderful uh, early boon here. Um, I'm Patrick McGarry. I'm one of the community monkeys working for Ink Tank. Um, we're the company that's bringing Ceph to the world. Um, how many of you guys are familiar with Ceph? All right, awesome. That means there's a whole chunk of my presentation that we can just fly right past. So that'll be even better. Um, just a little bit about me. Uh, like I said, I'm working for Ink Tank, uh, mostly doing the community stuff for Ceph. A um, little bit about me. I uh, started off most of my, uh, cutting my teeth of the community stuff, working for Slashdot. Uh, which is where I met Ross. For those of you that don't know him, he was SourceForge and I was Slashdot. Um, did a stint at ALU to uh, kind of get that whole, I worked for a big company thing out of my, my blood and, and now I'm done with that forever. Uh, and worked for uh, Perforce and now I'm here at Ink Tank. I finally feel like I've come home to the uh, open source world again, which is really nice. I'm also Scuttle Monkey on SlideShare. If you want to see these, they're up there. Uh, so here, um, what are we going to talk about? I'll breeze through the 30-second overview of Ceph uh, real quick. I had a little deeper dive on Ceph, um, which I can touch on a little bit in case there's questions. Go ahead and stop me or whatever. But it sounds like most of you folks are probably going to know the, the basics, the 101. Um, we'll touch on Ceph in the wild, which is the important part, right? That's the cloud stack piece, the Zen piece, uh, and then all the rest of the various things we can touch on a little bit too. Um, something I've been geeking out a lot about lately is the orchestration piece, so I like to touch on that a lot. Um, compare and contrast some of them. Uh, the nice part about it is uh, Ceph plays with basically all of the ones that I've seen thus far. I uh, learned about a new one this week. It was Deploy, uh, which I know nothing about. So uh, maybe uh, not that one for Ceph, but uh, can talk a little bit about the community status in case there's questions about that. Um, some what's next, uh, and then if there's any questions, we can uh, wrap those up at the end. So what's Ceph besides Wicked Awesome? Um, it's software. That's the biggest distinction that I think uh, some people don't understand, when, especially when we say uh, we're here to steal EMC and NetApp's lunch money. Um, it's software-defined storage. It's just a software daemon that runs on Linux. So um, that's basically all it is. Um, and it's really cool because it runs on commodity hardware and allows us to do storage really cheap um, with no single point of failure. Um, the other thing that's really interesting is it's all in one. Uh, it's object block and file all in a single cluster uh, and a lot of intelligence built right into it. Um, so a lot of people that are familiar with storage admins, uh, you know, they'll tell me, well, how many admins do I need to run it? Is, you know, and they'll tell me in the history, I'll have n terabytes per storage admin is kind of my rule of thumb. So everybody has some rule of thumb that they go by. Uh, and a, a, my favorite anecdote to answer with is, well, DreamHost has two Ceph clusters. One's three petabytes and one's five petabytes. They're both run by a single guy part time. So <laughs> that, uh, that usually kind of blows their mind for a minute, which is fun. Uh, and then Crush. Crush is the secret sauce that makes Ceph uh, so powerful. Uh, it's, it's the part that makes Ceph infrastructure aware, and it's the, uh, the, the placement algorithm that handles all of the data placement. Um, so it's really cool stuff. Uh, it was the original research that was done by Sage at UC Santa Cruz um, that kind of led to what Ceph is now. And then the, the, my favorite part about Ceph is the scale. It's meant for, you know, Huge, huge amounts of data. Uh, it was originally designed for supercomputing applications, um, so it was designed for exabyte scale. Um, so I'd, we haven't hit a limit yet. Uh, I'm looking forward to the day that someone decides to try. Uh, so yeah, that was fast. Uh, you can find out more. There's all kinds of good stuff. Ceph.com. Our uh, doc writer is kind of superhuman. I really, John Wilkins. He's amazing. Um, and then if you want to use it, you can play with Dream Objects. It's public, it's basically an S3 competitor, um, and it's all based on Ceph. Uh, and of course, if you know anybody that wants to pay for it, uh, Ink Tank is more than happy to take their money. So this is kind of the, the architecture diagram that explains how Ceph all fits together. Um, underneath it all, uh, as I'm sure most of you know at this point, it's an object store. Um, we get some really cool things for free by doing an object store underneath. 
Uh, we don't have to worry about you know the hierarchy of of basing it on files or anything like that. Um, you know the a lot of the in, you incorporated metadata and things like that that goes along with it. Although interestingly, um, Ceph doesn't actually have a whole lot of metadata unless you're dealing with CephFS. But on top of the object store, we expose um, that via three different inter interfaces. We have the RESTful APIs, which are the S3 and the OpenStack Swift um, gateway. We have our, our virtual disk, so that's our, our block device. Um, so the Ceph RBD. And then we have the CephFS, which is the POSIX compliant scale out file system. So, um, although for the developer centric folks, I usually like to show them this picture because there are actually two object interfaces. One of them's the low level library interface um, if you want to roll your own. So, of course, the basics of Ceph is you start with some amount of uh, disks. You have a big pile of disks in a in a data center somewhere, and you're going to throw some arbitrary file system on top of that. Um, we decided we didn't want to reinvent the wheel, um, so we took advantage of, uh, you know, our favorite is Butter, but obviously it's not quite there yet. Um, it's been not quite there for about a decade. But uh, <laughs> we, we think it's the future. We hope it's the future. There's some really cool stuff, uh, some underlying cloning and things like that that, are, that really make it cool. Uh, most of our folks that we have that are customers running in production are running on XFS. Um, the larger ext ex extended attributes make that uh, pretty cool. That's, that's what gets most of uh, the power from that one. Of course, you can run it on X4, and now ZFS. My presentation is uh, out of date, so ZFS is also in that list. Uh, and then, of course, that's you know one rack-mounted server, and you have many, many, many of these um, OSD machines. You know That's what the OSD is on top. That's the software daemon. The object storage daemon. Um, so you have many, many, many of these servers, uh, and then some small amount of uh, monitors in there as well that are uh, kind of the air traffic controllers. Uh, they they herd the cats. They do some authentication stuff, uh, but they actually are not in the data path. That's the cool part about Crush. Uh, Crush is that placement algorithm, and uh, it's what allows the clients to calculate where the data should go or where the data should be living, and go directly to the OSD. Uh, so there's no none of that you know single name node lookup um, slowdown that you have to worry about. Um, it's the pseudo random placement. Um, it's the thing that also uh, you're able to kind of define via a crush map what your infrastructure looks like in the data center. So you have you know n number of disks in y servers in x racks in uh, you know some number of rows uh, and. Based on that, you can then create rules about where you want your data to live. You want a fast data pool, you can say this pool data fast is uh, going to use my SSDs. Um, and, or you can combine by doing some number of you know, spinning rust with one SSD that handles the journal for all of them. Or you can create your own failure domains based on power circuits or whatever. Uh, so Crush is actually relatively simple, but also quite powerful in terms of what you can do with it. Um, this is the part we can probably breeze through. It just handles a bit about what happens when you want to stuff something into the cluster. You take it and you hash it into some number of what we're calling placement groups. These are just the, by default, they're four meg logical buckets that we cram into the various servers. Um, and so what happens is your client, you know, you're going to hash that and it'll, based on crush, you'll know where it needs to live. And so it'll send that to the OSD and write. The OSD then, based on your replication level, uh, will then peer-to-peer -peer with the other OSDs based on where it should live, based on crush. Uh, send those out. When those writes have finished and acknowledged the primary OSD, then it sends the acknowledgement that the write is done. Um, Ceph is a highly consistent uh, system, so that's how it has to work. Of course, you do this for many things all at once, and you see you kind of get this random distribution of data that's nice and pretty and even. And when the client comes in, uses crush to look up these things, it will read um, the original copy, or if the original copy, you know, gets, you know, your, half your data center burns down or something, it'll know where the other copies need to live and it can go there. Uh, speaking of which, uh, if you have a node failure, um, these OSDs are actually peering all the time uh, and saying who's up, who's down. Uh, and if you run, if you run into a case where an OSD thinks, you know, some number of OSDs are always reporting when they think one of them's down to the monitors. And the monitors are actually using a Paxos algorithm to decide, uh, to, to make this decision making of who's up, who's down, et cetera, et cetera. So when the decision is finally made that one's down, 
um, the OSDs that have the replicas of that data will know, um, hey, the, we're no longer kosher with our replication level, so we gotta fix that. Uh, and it'll automatically peer with the OSD based on the new crush map, where it needs to live, move the data, uh, and then the client will know where to go. Uh, so cool, we were able to breeze through that pretty quick. Uh, now we'll talk about Seth in the Wild. Um, anybody remember that show? Wild America with Marty Stauffer? God, I love that show. <laughs> uh, so Linux distros, um, no incendiary devices, please. Um, we work with a pretty fair number of, of uh, different distros. Um, obviously, our roots are pretty heavily in uh, Ubuntu. That's where we originally did most of our writing and testing. And, but you know, now we're in Apple. Um, I hear rumors that we'll be um, rel happy very soon. Um, but, uh, but yeah, there's, there's packages for all these guys. Um, so it's, it's, at this point, pretty easy to deploy, uh, depending on how you want to get it out there. Of course, OpenStack, um, there's a lot of stuff here. Uh, I will kind of breeze past that very quickly. Um, but of course, <laughs> the, the nice and fancy one, the cloud stack. Um, this one is a lot of fun uh, because I love this story as a community manager because this integration came entirely from the community. This wasn't something that Intank decided, hey, we're going to do this. It's strategic or biz dev or whatever the hell. It's a guy in the community said, I'm using cloud stack and I want to use Ceph, and he wrote it. Uh, it's Vito from 42 on, if you guys know him. Um, so right now, you can use it as alternate primary um, and secondary. So a lot of the snapshot and backup support stuff that he's been working on is coming in 4.2. And I just talked to him last week, and it's all done. It's package is ready to go. Uh, so we're just waiting for the arrival of that with um, 4.2. Um, he's also working on some RBD Java bindings for some of the other stuff. But uh, Right now, QMU and Libbert are creating images by format 1 by default, um, but he had to do a little bit of hacky stuff to make format 2 work. Um, so that's kind of where that's at now. So I guess it could use some polish, um, but the functionality will be there in, uh, in 4.2. Um, obviously, the RBD will be primary, um, and you'll actually be able to not have to have that, that little NFS mount that, uh, that has been required thus far. Um, and then we'll have the gateway. Uh, S3 interface for the secondary stuff, the templates and backups and ISOs and stuff like that. Uh, next one. All right. And this one, I blatantly ripped this off from Vito. Um, it's a good diagram of kind of how it works. Um, whether it's KVM or Zen, this is kind of the, the logical flow of how things fit together. Um, you know, the management server talks to the agent, runs KVM, hypervisor, et cetera. It's, you know, it's all right there. Um, I can leave that up for a minute. Um, but the important part here is the management server never talks to the Ceph cluster, um, so it kind of keeps that logical separation, so it makes it easy. There's not you know, an extra layer of code that we have to manage or anything like that, um, which means the, you know, given how that all lays out, uh, one management server can manage you know, thousands of these hypervisors, um, but also that the management servers can be clustered. Um, so I'm, I mean, you guys are probably all familiar with CloudStack. Um, but the cool part is that um, he's actually started playing with different implementations of uh, having multiple Ceph clusters uh, to do different workloads, uh, and, you know, so multiple pools, region stuff. Um, so he's actually been a good test bed for some of the region stuff. If you guys saw Sage's talk this morning about a lot of the geo replication um, that we've been working on. So there's, there's a lot of thought that's going into that. The, um, the gateway and the block device, uh, they have answers to geo-replication, uh, mostly from a you know, disaster recovery standpoint. Uh, but the next thing that's on the way that we're all really excited about is that the underlying RADOS infrastructure is actually going to have the ability to define regions and zones and do multiple uh, geographically aware pieces. So that's, that's nice. Uh, of course, you know, I couldn't say cloud without talking about some of our other friends. You know, we're in the SUS cloud. Um, we, d we work with Google Gennetti, um, Proxmox, Open Nebula. Um, there's actually a talk next week in Berlin, um, if any of you guys are going to make it that far that fast. Um, the Joel Merrick from the BBC is talking about his adventures in uh, research. So he's talking about some of his experiments with uh, Zen and KVM, OpenStack, CloudStack, um, some of his Ceph stuff in there. Um, so there's, there's some really cool stuff. Um, it's, it's always nice to see it through the eyes of a user. Um, but it's definitely worth it if you're going to be in the area, or um, I think they might actually be live streaming that event, too, if you can find that. Um, 
beyond the cloud stuff, you know, project intersection, um, we have obviously close ties with the kernel for a long time. Um, we have native clients for RBD and CephFS, um, and a lot of uh, active development in the Linux kernel. Alex Elder, one of our guys, actually made the top list of the, the report that came out this week. That we're all very excited. Uh, we thought he was, uh, he got major cool points for that in the office. Um, we have things like a Wireshark plugin. Um, you know, we've done some work with the for iSCSI via the TGT library, um, working on LIO next, uh, and we're actually. There, there have been some very creative solutions where people were using VMware uh, because they wanted to use Ceph, but they had Windows infrastructure they had to deal with. Uh, so they got, the guy got really creative and did a, a fiber channel into Ceph uh, so that he could back his VMware infrastructure. Some, so definitely some cool hacky project intersection, um, as well as, you know, like a, we're a drop-in replacement for HDFS on a Hadoop. We're upstream in Samba. Um, the Ganesha project is being used to re-export both CephFS and uh, RBD, so the, the file system and our block device, as uh, NFS and SIFs. Uh, and of course, the Zen server stuff. Um, so doing it with Zen, all things Zen. Um, this has actually been really exciting for us because it's another thing that uh, has coming a lot from the community. Um, we didn't really push hard for that, but we're definitely happy to help it along. Um, you know, obviously the support for Libvirt um, you know, it's, it looks like most of the faces around here are all Zen experts, so I'm not going to try and talk to you about that because I know far less than most of the people here. But um, obviously we started um, with the, the block tap driver 2 and 3, and, and now it's kind of exploded, and it's, you know, moving to the, you know, QEMU, the new boss, same as the old boss. Um, but the one thing I did want to touch on is something that's kind of a point of confusion for the community from a community standpoint, um, which is the naming stuff, right? Zen versus, or Ceph versus Zen server versus libvirt, kind of how we talk about things. You know, we talk about a block device, uh, Zen server talks about a VDI, and, and libvirt talks about storage volume, right? Or pools versus storage repos versus storage pools. You know, it's just kind of different uh, vocabulary. Um, and uh, the guy who's been doing a lot of the work on the, um, the Ceph and Zen integration uh, actually had a really good talk uh, in London, I think it was. It's made the rounds on YouTube if you've seen it. Um, I ripped this off from him because it was just perfect. You know, it talks. It gives you a really clear indication of kind of how this stuff is falling together. Um, the client stuff, you know, Cloud Stack, OpenStack, Zen Desktop, whatever it is, you know, going through Zappy, Zen API stuff. Um, then you've got your domain manager, um, you know, and then it, which goes down to your kind of the Zen control library and the standard Zen libraries. And um, this QMU obviously being the what is it called in Zen uh, vernacular? Upstream Kimu, <laughs> not the not the older one. <laughs> and of course, on the other side, we've got the storage plugins, the SM adapters, um, which talk through Libvirt uh, and lets you to do. This is the experimental part um, that's kind of out there as a tech preview right now um, that allows you to talk to things like Ceph um, or like OCFS2 or things like that. So, pretty exciting. Uh, I like to refer to Zen or to, to Ceph as a gateway drug, um, the, and you know Zen, CloudStack, OpenStack is is great example of, you know we see people come in that way, uh, you know they'll come in for block and stay for the object and file, um, but the and we are, I already talked about the reduced overhead, but um, it's really exciting to see some of the the prototypes that come out of that. You know somebody will say, okay I need block storage, and they'll get the block storage and they'll be happy, and they'll say, well hey there's a couple other interfaces here I can tinker with, um, so. But we're seeing a lot of like the, the Intel guys. I think he might actually have to go to addiction counseling or something. Uh, he did. He's done 700 patches in the last three months for CephFS. <laughs> so it's it's pretty neat to see um, just kind of how this this works. Putting it all together, you know, you get one piece that brings you in, and people kind of kind of go nuts from there. Um, so I can talk a little bit about the block object and and file, but. I think I'd probably breeze through these, and if there's questions, we can touch on those. Um, so the cool parts about each of these for Ceph, you know, obviously the being Ceph, uh, talking about some of those wins that we got from having an object la layer underneath. Um, one of the really cool parts about that in terms of a block device, it allows you to do cool things like uh, squash hotspots. So things like, uh, because you're taking that block device and striping it over a number of, of physical hosts um, in the object layer, you uh, actually get to parallelize a huge amount of your workload. And so 
you have, can have your block device be arbitrarily large or arbitrarily busy, uh, and it doesn't, doesn't matter. Um, we can also do things like instant clones and live migration and all that stuff because it's all the uh, same storage backend. Um, the object, uh, you know, like I said, we do Swift and S3. Um, they're well-established APIs, so it's, it's nice, you know, if you have a, a, an app that you've written to use S3, you just change the endpoint and you're done. Um, uh, this is this is the secondary storage part for CloudStack, um, and there's also some very easy horizontal scaling. It plugs into existing things, like you can just put them behind an HA proxy box, and and you're ready to go. Uh, and this is the the file system, which I haven't spent a whole lot of time talking about, um, and and just as we haven't spent a whole lot of time QAing it, which is kind of uh, why we aren't telling people to go ahead and use this in production. Uh, we've obviously focused our efforts on the object and block part of the house because that's where all of the demand thus far has really been. Um, the thing with the file system is it's the only time that you have to introduce the, the metadata server piece of the Ceph kind of family of, of nodes. Um, and that's, that's only the like directory, you know, timestamp kind of metadata stuff. Um, again, it's not in the data path. Um, for the data, you still go directly to the OSD. You just also have to pull that extra little bit from the metadata server. And this also is, uh, has the ability to be horizontally scalable. You can turn on many, 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 uh, and this is one of those uh, experimental parts that hasn't been QA'd a lot, but the Ceph metadata servers have the ability to spin up many of them, and we have actually what's called, uh, what we're calling dynamic subtree partitioning. So as your directory um, gets busy, you have hotspots, you know, all the way down to a single file or a part of the tree or whatever, uh, as there's use, uh, these metadata servers will kind of shuffle the load between them, um, and you can even have a single metadata server serving for a single file if it's you know that busy or whatever. So uh, that's that's one of the really cool, exciting parts about Ceph um, that we just haven't been able to get to yet. And there's a lot of guys inside Ink Tank that really want to work on it. We just haven't had the time. Um, so this is the deployment stuff that I've been geeking out about. Uh, I always like to touch on this stuff. You know, one of the most often asked questions that I get is, okay, Ceph sounds cool. How, do, how can I use it? How do I get there from here? Um, so I like to touch on the orchestration stuff. Obviously, you know, Chef and Puppet, these guys are the, you know, maybe the, the 200 pound gorillas in the room. They're the mature options that most people have heard of. Um, you know, Chef being more of the dev side of DevOps and Puppet being more of the, you know, procedural sysadmin kind of crowd that they're aiming at. Um, Ansible and Salt, though, are kind of the other end of that spectrum. They're the ones that have kind of gone from zero to hero in a very short amount of time. Um, and each of them has their own stuff. Uh, we heard about Salt. Um, Salt is really cool because it's fast, fast, fast. Uh, I've seen some people do some crazy, silly things uh, with Salt at scale, um, deploying thousands of things at the same time, and it's just ridiculously fast. Um, Ansible is kind of neat. I like it because it's, um, uh, it's agentless. So it's, it's very lightweight, it's a very light touch. Uh, it has kind of a different uh, mindset. And then, you know, there's some more options. Uh, Juju is kind of my favorite when I'm just tinkering and playing around with things. Uh, it seems to work the same way my brain does, which, you know, might be backwards, but I'm not sure. Uh, Canonical has done some really fun things. Um, making it relatively agnostic. If you already like Chef and you want to do stuff with Juju, uh, you can just use your Chef recipe right, and wrap it in Juju. Same with Puppet, or same with Python, or Bash, or whatever you want to use to deploy. Uh, you can wrap it in Juju, which gives you the advantage then of being able to talk to Mass. If you guys know Metal as a service, it's their bare metal things. And you can go all the way from the bottom all the way up with Mass and Juju, and it plugs together, and it's really cool. Um, some other hitters there, there's Crowbar. You know, Dell has some skin in the game. Uh, Commod IT I threw in there just basically saying, you know, there's a lot of people that are doing home rolling their own thing. There's so many flavors out there. Um, and then Ceph Deploy, which is kind of our, you know, do it without, uh, without a tool. This is our, you know, quick, you know, eight commands or whatever to get yourself to a Ceph cluster um, if you really don't want to don't use somebody else's overhead. Uh, community, I'll touch on the community stuff just a little bit. Um, just wanted to throw some slides in there for the people that are voracious about downloading stuff off of SlideShare. Um, Ink Tank, a little bit of history on Ceph. Uh, there were kind of four main periods of Ceph development, uh, and this actually shows um, the number of authors cumulative 
uh, to kind of show the growth of each of these inflection points. You know, there was the res research project, which is the first block uh, at UC Santa Cruz. There was kind of an incubation period where Ceph was still being developed inside of DreamHost. Uh, and then the launch where it got spun out into Ink Tank, uh, and then kind of the growth period that we've seen um, with things like integration with OpenStack and CloudStack and, and some of that stuff that's really kind of been our next inflection point. Um, we've seen some really cool code contributions. Um, just wanted to show this that, uh, you know, the, the employee additions versus the non-employee contributions, um, you know, it's up and to the right. I uh, don't want to spend a lot of time on this. Commits. So this commit graph is actually pretty cool. I don't know if you can see very well. Uh, I guess not. So the blue at the bottom is Sage, <laughs> one human, uh, although human is, is relatively debatable. Uh, <laughs> Uh, the yellow is obviously uh, ink tank contributions, and then the purple is, is community contributions. So those are really started to take off uh, in recent history here. So um, a lot of it's our friends from Intel, but uh, obviously there's a good number of people. Uh, Daniel Gaff did a whole bunch of work too. He's a big part of that pie. Uh, and then you know the lists, the, the blue stuff is us, and the, the yellow stuff is all community. So this is list. Um, and the, I didn't want to put it on here to duplicate, but the IRC participation looks almost exactly the same as the list. So, um, so what's next? Uh, so the Ceph train, uh, the Ink Tank plans um, really are about geo-replication, which Sage spent, uh, talked about this morning. Uh, definitely check out his slides. He has some really good deep dives into kind of what the thinking is around that stuff. Um, there's a lot to think about, it turns out, um, all the way from, you know, clocks all the way up, so lots of stuff to think about. Um, the erasure coding stuff is actually nearing completion. Uh, this has been some good work here. Um, it, this is especially interesting as it relates to the other thing next to it, which is tiering. Um, some folks want to take and have multiple dynamic tiering. You know, it gets hot and it goes up to the SSDs, it gets cold, it goes down to some platters, but in combination with that, those platters, uh, people want to do erasure coding so they don't have to have as many replicas and they can squeeze some more dollars out of the bottom end. Um, and then governance. Um, we are pretty open, but we want to make it uh, open-er. Um, so we've been talking a lot about this and, and kind of progressing our uh, every quarter uh, after or, or as we approach our next stable release, uh, we hold our Ceph Developer Summit, which is a virtual summit. Uh, thus far, it's been on Google Hangouts, but that's, I think, not going to continue because we have too many people for it. Um, but, but we hold blueprint process, so anybody that wants to write something or wants to see something written, uh, they have a submission window where you say, hey, here's a blueprint, this is what we want, uh, and then we all get together at the Developer Summit and talk about how we're going to get there. Um, of course, you know, I, I wouldn't be a community manager if I didn't plug Get Involved, you know, the Ceph Developer Summit, which I talked about. Uh, we have a number of Ceph days. We've done um, Three at this point, we did one in Amsterdam, one in New York, and one in Santa Clara last week. Uh, we have one coming up soon in London, um, second week in October, I think. Um, so, I mean, if you want ideas, Developer Summit and Ceph Day are great places to do face-to-face, -face, you know, meet space communications where we figure out, uh, hey, what's happening, how can I help? Of course, IRC in the lists. And if you're looking for project ideas, we have project ideas on our wiki. Uh, Redmine obviously is the easiest place because that's where everything kind of is held in brain trust. Uh, and again, IRC in the lists. So, questions? All right. We breeze through that in no time flat, and uh, we'll be out of here early for beer. That's awesome. Let's give Patrick a round of applause.